Episode 6, Sam Fouch Show. I'm here with Corey Gardner, a.k.a. Corey the Broker. How are we doing, Corey? I'm great, man. Thanks for having me. No problem. Excited th- to be here. Th- thank you so much for your time. This is a very valuable time. Mr. Uh, Mr. Corey's a busy, busy man. He's a 4 a.m. 4 a.m. guy. Corey the Broker, 445 Club. 445 Club, that's what it is. I hashtag it on the story. I don't post it. I should post it. Joe, uh, not Joe, uh, Jocko Willink is where I got the idea. Really? Ex-Navy SEAL. How, how consistently do you do that time? Not consistently enough. Like um, in a week? In, in a week, I probably get, I'll probably go two or three weeks where it's consistently every single day of the week. <sighs> but then like either I travel or like I stay up late yeah. or like, um, you know, earlier this week I was, I was, we were, with, I was with business partners. We were talking about business till like 1230, 1 a.m. Nothing you can do there. I'm can not going to wake up before o'clock. I probably like could. I probably should. Uh, but I, I, you know, I'll kill the rest of my day if I'm doing that. So. I understand. Sometimes like you want to stay committed, but at the same token, you don't want to feel like crap and destroy your day. Exactly. I mean, you know, a little bit of it's a, a, a psychological thing. Like you should be able to have a dynamic mindset where if I'm not waking up early, it yep. doesn't ruin my day. And yes. I come from a place where I need mental practice like that. Yep. Um, so it, it's, it's a practice, man. I mean, but when I do do it, I feel great. Like I killed it. Like it's, it's my whole day is the whole thing is I get the hardest parts of my day out in the beginning. Yep. So no matter what happens throughout the day, yep. I'm good to go. You knock it all out. I've early. got my meditation done. I've got my gym done. I've got my journaling done. Like I'm good. So like whatever, I need to go to a meeting. I need to hang out with friends. Like I'm cool, man. I've got, I've got my important stuff done. Well, and Wyatt and I, you know, we'd always try to do the 5:30 thing, and we we would do it where, like, literally that weekend we would stay up late, whatever, and then we try to do it Monday, and we can't fall asleep. Yeah, and for we're sure. Like, why would why would we sacrifice that day? Our focus is we always would tell each other, well, regardless, if we don't get up at 5:30. Only thing that matters is what you do when you're awake. Gary Vee preaches on that heavily. He's like, you, you can sleep six, seven, eight hours. I yeah. don't care, but only what thing you, that matters what are you doing is doing the rest of the day. Yeah, are you watching Netflix? Yeah. Are you doing this? Blah blah blah. Yeah. Um, Audit your time. Exactly. What do you do for journaling? Uh, like, what do you mean? Like, what kind of journaling do you do? It, I mean, I don't do anything structured. It's, it's, oh, okay. I'm just kind of free writing. I'm, putting your I'm thoughts writing, out putting there. my thoughts down there. Like, anything personal, business, whatever I'm kind of feeling. There's a lot of times where I'm like, I really don't feel like journaling today. And really? Sometimes I won't. Yep. Um, sometimes I'll do it anyway, just sort of like a, you know, a little bit of a meditation practice to, to do the thing that I don't want to do. Um, but there's no structure to it. It's sort of, I write until I feel like, okay, I've kind of, Recapitulated what I needed to share from my brain, and Good word. now it's Reca- on paper. Recapitulated, and, you know. Now it's it's out there, and I can keep moving on. I do this thing. I I literally just did it a month ago. We'll we'll get structure in a second. Sure, but <laughs> I okay. like this is I love journaling. Yeah, I, yeah. I call it little wins. Mm. So then, right before I go to bed, I like I literally write out the little things just so you have an awareness that you're doing something. That's cool. That you don't like. You yeah. know, you can go through your day thinking you're you not, don't feel useless. Yeah. And then when I write it all out, I'm like, dang, I actually did something today. That's cool. You know, it's 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 working well for me. Um, but let's get into it, Corey. Yeah, gosh, sure. he's a he's a rock star. Uh, actually, I got I came up with this word, a titan in the industry. I like it from a uh, a commercial brokerage brokerage. You're not you don't own a brokerage, do you? I don't own a brokerage. No. So he's a commercial broker, yep. which commercial broker is he's not selling, say, a typical standard home. He's selling buildings, businesses, et cetera. Yep. But he's also a real estate investor as well here in yep. the uh, in the Indianapolis area. Let's start, Corey. Let's start from the beginning. I like sure. to do a time thing, time frame thing. How, how old are you? I'm 27. 27. Wait, yeah. What? No, I'm 20, 26. I turn 27 next month. Oh, gosh. <laughs> Freak starting to forget, man. <laughs> That's funny. No, you're good. Yeah. So he's 20, 26. Yeah. When did you get your first, like, did, did you go to college? Yeah, so I went to IU, studied uh, psychology and cognitive science. That's a good degree. Um, I was in a network marketing business back in college. That was kind of where I cut my teeth in business. Yep. That's where I learned yep. my, my networking social skills. Um, Ruined a lot of relationships, but also made a lot of good relationships. Some of my best friends today were from that experience. Graduated, went to move to Chicago in 2015. Started working for an early stage software company. Nice. Um, doing sales. I kind of always knew that I was going to get into real estate or business. I didn't know what, okay. in what regard. And uh, um, it was sort of a big industry to to break into for massive, somebody looking out industry. outside into real estate. It was like, what do I do? Yeah. Like you, I started uh, watching Bigger Pockets podcast um, every single day. I just, yep. you know, fire hose worth of content. And when I was in Chicago, I joint ventured, bought a four unit on the south side. Uh, kind of just dove in at first. I bought first property. Um, through that process, it was supposed to be a flip. It turned out to a modified burr, which is buy, rent, 
buy, rehab, rent, refinance, and then yep. repeat. We held on to that, sold that, but through that whole process, I realized as an investor, number one, I wanted to continue to do this and scale it up, and number two, um, why don't I cut out the middleman and become my own agent so I can mm. sell my own deals? So I studied and got my license, and when I got my license, I was like, oh, wait a minute. I can build a business around servicing other investors who are doing the same thing, buying property, selling property. So mm. now I started to build a book of business. Um, got connected with Kim here in Indianapolis. I had family and friends back in Indiana. Um, so I was commuting here. I had business and real estate here. Eventually moved back in April of 2017. And I started off in the residential space. That's where gotcha. I, you know, I, I was, again, cutting my teeth. Um, and I actually still sell residential real estate today. Uh, but I don't, I don't do any business development there. It's all referral-based clients. It's mm. all stuff that, you know, friends, family, hey, can you help me out with this? So I'll, I'll do all of that. Um, but growth, like trajectory where I'm headed is expanding into the commercial space, um, specifically multifamily, um, and then some other asset classes. I'm interested in self-storage and industrial. Me too. Um, so that's kind of the trajectory and path, but that whole journey has taken, you know, four, four or five years now. That's so interesting to so you were an investor before an agent yeah exactly that's crazy yeah that's it, a it, it was it was sort of like a i don't know what the phrase is but like it made sense for me to do both yeah i'm right there that's my yeah, goal is yeah. to, to i figured if i could you know day to day as an agent you're looking at properties you're knowing the markets blah 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 exactly if i'm going to be doing that let me just take all my excess money and invest it in my, exactly i mean that's precisely that, that's what my it is. vision and then obviously the same the the podcast is just for marketing to sell more houses. Uh, but let's go back then. Yeah. Because normally I'd talk about, you know, if, I, if you're an agent, I figure we'd go that with scale. But let's talk about that first deal. How did that even, how did you find that? How oh did you, God. yeah. Was Where was that at? Was that in Chicago? South side of Chicago. Okay. Um, it would take me an hour and a half on the red line to get there every weekend to go look at the project. Oh, nice. Uh, but I was committed, man. I was going down there. I spent a crap ton of money on it. it How'd awful. you find it? Um, so I, I was I was partnered with, some guys that actually met on bigger pockets, nice. retrospectively, not the right group to be collaborating with. Gotcha. Just not good people. I think they were doing some fraudulent stuff. Um, I didn't know any of that at the time. I was, <laughs> I was too, too naive. Yeah. Um, so you partnered with them? Yeah, I was partnered okay. up. They, this guy, this one guy found or knew of a wholesaler who had the deal. Gotcha. We paid way too much money for this deal. Um, but anyway, we, we, we got it under contract, bought it. And then it was just a renovation process from there. We had to, it was a complete gut rehab. Okay. Get down to the studs, new mechanicals, uh, new framing, new roof. You know, that really, the, the only thing that remained was the structure. Yeah. Um, and it was, de I mean, retrospectively, like what we took it from to what we turned it into was, was a nice, nice project. Yeah. I, mean, I didn't know what I was doing it's at the time. your first one, shoot. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know where to take it, but. Um, How'd you guys finance it? Uh, so, uh, dude, I was it just you and one other guy? Uh, at the in the beginning, it was, and we brought in a third capital partner. Okay. Um, so we just pooled our, our cash and, and paid cash for it. Cat, you didn't get a bank loan? No, not FHA, upfront. nothing. No, I didn't have to do any of that. Um, what was it? So it was a four unit, like just four, like just when you say four unit, that's not like yeah. So like I mean four apartments in one building. Okay. So it was a it was a two bedroom, one bathroom times four. Okay. Two story brick building, square, just kind of rectangular box. Yeah. Um, yeah. What was the cost of that? Jeez, man, I don't know. We paid seventy five, but the actual value was fifty. So we paid this wholesaler fifteen k, which isn't like outrageous, but like yeah. at the time, this building was not worth that. How we, much did you have to do renovation wise? Way, way too much. Really? I mean, we spent way too much money on it. You just contracted all out? Contracted it all out. Again, this guy that I was working with kind of had connections. Um, yeah. So we were relying on his resources, which was a dumb decision. Uh, but, it's know, first one, dude. At least you yeah, jumped sure. in. I mean, like we figured it out. Like yeah. learned a ton. Like learned who to, who not to work with, how to interact with contractors. That's all. It not is. to spend like ten grand on windows. Like just stupid stuff. <laughs> like that you just don't know. And like you until know, you do time, it, I didn't have anybody mentoring or like. Um, somebody kind of poking me in the face saying, Hey, this is stupid. Yeah. I did later on, but like you know, at that point it was too late. So my, I got I had my grandpa and my dad for when that time. Yeah, comes. exactly. It's good to have somebody to kind of, you know, I don't know diddly squat. It's just people around <laughs> me know it. And I just ask them questions and figure it out. That's exactly. a, you're only as good as the people yeah, around it's you. It's resourceful though. Resourceful. So, so um, do you still own those properties? Chicago, no, no, we sold no. that. That was, so when I sold that building, 
that was my opportunity to kind of cut my ties with Chicago entirely because nice. um, I moved back here in April 2017 and then we sold it um, so I could focus on Indianapolis real estate full time. So once I moved here, um, I reallocated that capital. I bought a two unit and then a six unit downtown Indianapolis mm. uh, in the same year, just sold the two unit. And uh, now I've got a chunk of change that I'm looking to, to reinvest into something bigger. So did you ever get back to the Chicago? Did you ever get that four unit up and like renting? Yeah, it was up and operating. We, we operating, were operating, I should it. say. Um, it, was, it was rented. Um, we castled for a little bit, but our biggest thing was just trying to get rid of it as soon as we possibly could. <laughs> That's funny. Because uh, it, it was just a total train wreck. But, really? Yeah. So then you left Chicago. You're still not a broker though, right? Uh, when you come to Indy, I, no. I, when I moved to Indianapolis, I got my, I had I had my license. I did okay. not move to Indy until I had my license. Gotcha. So, April 2017 is when I became a licensed agent. And then you came here, and then you bought what was it? A two unit? Yeah, duplex, two unit. So two apartments in one building. Is that just you, or do you have a partner on that too? I had a capital partner, but it was just me. I had discretionary capital that I had access to. Did you so, have to do rehab on that? That one we did a little bit of updating. It, it, it wasn't, you know, in, in a dire situation like the four unit. It was mostly just cosmetic stuff. So yeah. I think we painted, did some like touch ups in the basement structurally and you know, rented I, it out. It was good to go. We bought it. It was vacant off market, um, you know, so it, it needed some some love to become an investment grade property. But how did you find that one? Um That one was actually on the market. So I bought that one with my license. Nice. The guy selling it bought it as part of a portfolio, and it was outside of his comfortability in terms of his footprint for where he owns his other properties. He's like, I don't want this. We got rid of it. So you still own that one today? No, no. We sold that one, and then uh, that's what the, the capital that I have now. I'm uh, looking okay. to redeploy it. But you have that six unit? Yep, still have the six unit. And that it's, one has tenants in it, et cetera, yep, et cetera? fully occupied. Is it a, you doing leases or short term? or? Yeah, so I'm glad you asked that. So I do a combination. I tried to mitigate the risk a little bit Smart. and Smart. dabble in the in the short-term rental space. Um, but I don't do traditional like Airbnb okay. know, days in and like over weekends what do you and stuff. Yeah, what do you do? I, I focus on longer stays, so 30, 60, 90 day stays. Okay. A little bit less turnover, a little bit less um, wear and tear on, on the units because these people are Versus the longer. one. Yeah, versus weekends, people are just coming in or staycations. That makes sense. People can make a boatload of money doing that. Yes. I just pivoted away from doing super short-term um, cause you know, I'm not interested in hospitality per se. It's no. not the business that I was trying to get into. I'm nope. just looking to, to turn a profit with the building basically. Of course. That's, that's life. Yeah. So what is your benefits in regards to that 30, 60, 90 day model versus the typical six month to one year? Yeah. Oh, well, so what, what I was like just comparing that to, oh, to the short term, to short term. Now, oh, okay. if you want to compare short term. 30, 60, 90 day to a, a standard lease. Yes. Uh, the downsides are I, my overhead's a little bit higher because I'm it's all bills paid. I'm paying for all the utilities because these people are coming in. Oh, they don't need to worry about anything. That's interesting. But my net return, my, my net my net cash flow is is thirty to fifty percent higher than a standard lease would be. Really? Yeah. Even though you're paying all the even utilities, even though I got to pay all that, and even though I got to furnish it. That's interesting. Um, but the risk is, you know, it's kind of variable. You know, I might not get somebody, so I may have a vacancy for a month. Mm. But I make up that difference for the next 90-day contract that comes in. Wow. I have not heard of that. Even all the bigger pockets, I've never heard anybody doing that. Um, Unless it, I wasn't paying attention. But I don't know. I don't... I don't. Did you come I, up with that, or did you no, it's, snag it? No, I, I certainly did. <laughs> I wish I did. Um, <laughs> no, uh, awesome. I don't know where I first heard it, to be honest. Probably... Kim, my business partner that I worked very closely with, probably we just stumbled upon it somewhere. I can't even remember. This was because we've been doing this for three years now. I don't even know where it first came up. It's not a new concept necessarily. You can think about it like an executive stay. There's there's corporate programs out there for um, the corporate world. Will they'll, they'll they will put up somebody in a hotel or like yep. a property, and they are the middleman for that whole process. It's the same thing, but it's on a smaller privatized scale. Gotcha. It's not a corporate level, um, so. It's not a new concept, but we're just kind of taking advantage of that that space. Are you doing the property management side of all that, or do you? Yeah, so I'm kind of high-level operations. I'm not necessarily day-to-day -day yeah. turning units by any means. I've got a team that we've put together that handles all of that, but the, the higher-level operations, yeah. Really? Yeah. That's interesting. Okay, so we've talked about the investing side of your portfolio. Let's yeah. bounce to the, uh, the agent side. For sure. So you started in residential. Yep. Here in Indy? Yep. So how did that, how did your first, I love asking this question because yeah. anybody who wants to break into the, the real estate game as an agent, for sure. I always say first six to 12 months or what I've heard is just don't focus on the, sure. uh, 
the uh, the amount of money you're making that year because you are a new business owner, you're an entrepreneur, and I mean it's just not easy. So how was your first six to twelve months selling? Uh, it was real- awesome. I mean, what was great about my experience is that I already had a lot of knowledge coming in as an investor. So, so that is I already kind of knew what people were looking for. I already kind of sure. knew like how to navigate the space for sure. Um. One of my first properties that I sold was a flip. I set the market over in East Fountain Square. We had the highest selling comp cost per square foot. That sparked sort of a revitalization of that part of part of East Fountain Square. So that was cool to kind of see a result of yeah. something that I sold. What's revitalization mean? Uh, so like you've got dilapidated homes in a neighborhood. What does dilapidated mean? <laughs> Sorry, this is a vocab, uh, good, vocab good, podcast. Good buzzwords to break down. For yeah, I don't know what they mean. Um, <laughs> so imagine you are driving down the street and you see a house and it looks awful. Mm. Things are falling apart. Gotcha. Windows are broken in. Grass is overgrown. You know, it looks like it needs new paint. Yep. It probably needs a new roof. That would, in my book, be classified as dilapidated. Oh, okay. So run down, run down. For a simpler term? Exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. And what was the other word? That I Revitalization. What's that mean? That's sort of taking those dilapidated homes. Bringing it up? Bringing it up, but at scale. At scale. Hmm. Learn something. I, I don't know That's if this I'll... is like official terminology. Like, do not quote this. and like, <laughs> Oh, this is what this means. Corey the broker said this. I don't think it's... Put it as a little quote for yeah. a piece of content. <laughs> you can do that if you want. But Corey the broker, revitalization, yeah. and then what you said. That's so funny. Exactly. So how did you find your... If you remember, some people... How did you find your first deal that you closed on... Um, so, you, so I, I had I had done some networking here in Indianapolis. I had yep. I had friends, connections. So okay. it was just through networking. It was simple as that. Yeah, I scaled from there from sort of what you said your friend did, DMing people on on bigger pockets, bigger pockets. and whatnot. Um, that was initially sort of how I started to build my book of business. Was was it was just all networking. It was networking, referrals, getting my name out there, and now it's at a point where. It's not passive, but yeah. I have business coming in. People have worked with me in the past, yep. and it's it's very referral based. People talk about real estate being a referral business, and coming into it, I'm like, oh yeah, like I don't need referrals, like I can do this on my own. Uh-huh. But like on the flip, it's like that's the most powerful form of new business because when somebody says, hey, I love this experience working with this person, yep, and then you go and service them as a customer, and they have the same experience, you've doubled down on that first experience, yep. and now you have another referral person, like. So anyway, I, I try to invest my energy and time into those referrals as much as I can. Do you do any other forms of marketing to drum up new business? You know, obviously posting content. We yeah, for sure. So social any? social media stuff. Other than that, no. Like I, I've um, I've really not spent the time, energy, and probably the money that I, I may maybe should have starting out as an agent. Yeah. Partially because I was very focused on my own investing business, gotcha. not necessarily trying to grow my brokerage business. Gotcha. Um, I'm at a point now where like, I'm looking at maybe putting a team together on the brokerage side and yep. like investing a little bit more resource wise into that side of things. Yep. Uh, because that's, that's really a vehicle to, to accessing, you know, greater things in real estate. But, um, I did, I don't work for a big box brokerage. I'm not the traditional realtor, at least starting out in a sense of, gotcha. um, you know, looking for, for retail buyers and sellers. So for me, it was sort of, it didn't make it didn't align with where my vision and goals were, so gotcha. I, you know I just didn't invest into it. But I'm looking at that stuff now. So how do you break down? Because you're an investor and a, a, a broker. How do you break down your time, like day to day? Do you put a portion of your energy into your properties, or is it strictly investing and then you're kind of doing on the sidelines of doing? Yeah. Or what kind of? It's it's a it's a little bit. I don't know. For me, it's it's sort of been finding a balance of like. What do I need to get done? What's, what what's needs, top priority? What are the biggest here? fires? Let me do what those are, first. Exactly, man. It's that's, putting out fires all day long. And, and so it's not always bad fires, but like, you know, if I've got three transactions going on and something's time time critical, yep. something else isn't, well, I need to prioritize the time critical thing and then yep. I can move on to the next task. Exactly. So the way I've sort of structured it is you, you know my mornings, but after that, when I'm getting into my work day, um, I've, I've done a little bit of just time blocking where I'm like, okay, for this yep. portion of my day, I sort of have my tasks that I need to complete. Here's what I'm going to work on and focus on. And once that's done, I can move on to other stuff. Whether that be you know, new business development in the commercial space, cold yep. calling apartment buildings, um, business owners, stuff like that. And then if if I've you know spent a chunk of my block time doing that, then mm. I move on to the next thing. Um Smart. So it, it kind of just depends on the demands of what I need to do that week or what, what I need to do that day. Uh, but I try to, you know, 
pack it in, man. I'm trying to get as much done. Much done, done single yeah, day. For sure. So how did you go from residential to commercial? What made you want to make that jump? That's a great question. So through the experiences in the residential space, um, listening to bigger pockets, yep. seeing other investors, but also just paying attention to the business world. Mm. I started to recognize that like where the big money is made, there you where, go. where the corporations play at. Um, the residential space is great, but at scale, for somebody like myself, yep. I'm not a REIT. I don't have hedge fund access. Mm. I don't have a, a you know millions of dollars where I'm buying single family portfolios. Yes. How do I access that same those same economies of scale? For somebody my level, you buy apartments. You and buy save apartment. time. You save time, yeah. too. Um, but so I was like, okay, so there's economies of scale here in, in scaling out of residential, getting into the commercial space. Let's start paying attention to that. So I just started doing research. Yep. And once I started focusing my time on that, um, you know, business came up a couple years ago. I, I had a, a client, and they were like, hey, we're looking to invest in Indianapolis. So I helped them buy an apartment building here mm -hmm. in Indianapolis. And then I just continued doing that process, and now that's like, that's what I spend most of my time focused on now is, is commercial apartments. Well, and just, and so that's from a agent side of things. Quote me if I'm wrong from what I've taken on a, uh, a bigger pockets podcast is like, say you buy a single family home. It, it has all the metrics of insurance, all this different paperwork, all, all the things you have to do for that one home. Whereas if you go do this eight unit, right, right. you can do, you have to do all the same processes but you can do it in one hit for eight versus one. Exactly. So that's why they always say, well, you can do your single family. And you have, I mean, you don't have to start in that realm, but they always say to start single family and then scale up. But no, that's exactly right. You can knock it all out because it, it comes back to time. Like, would you rather sell one single family home or sell an apartment complex? It's economies of scale. That's all it is. It's, it's accessing that same one, but you're multiplying by eight. Exactly. Well, time too. I mean, yeah, you, your time is. So how did that go? Gosh, how does that go with selling a single family home versus an apartment complex? What's the different um, it's level of sophistication? Okay. How uh, much you know uh, when you say that? The, or Well, I mean like the, the type of client you're working with. Mm. Somebody selling a house, especially in the retail space, it's a very emotional decision. Very emotional. Buying or selling, either way, retail space, very emotional. Yes. When I say retail, I mean like somebody who's purchasing property to live in it, not to produce income. Mm. When you flip to somebody looking to... to purchase something for to produce income it's it's a logical business numbers. decision numbers yep. um, not emotional so I was number one back to why I did that I was attracted to that mm. I wanted to operate in that space um, but the differences are so yes there's also a different level of knowledge what's cool though about commercial is it's sort of the wild west you can kind of do whatever you want really? like, there's some rules and restrictions and guidelines you still got to follow but like you could be extremely creative so one That's of the advantages to to that space is like um, just the creativity. I mean, you, there's a there's a, a, a million ways to, to do a deal in the commercial space and residential, kind of the same thing, but there's a little bit more of stricter guidelines you have to follow. Um, but there's a, there's a knowledge component. There's a yep. sophistication component. There's also a capital component. You're spending, whoever is spending quite a lot more money. Big bucks. Um, <laughs> what's cool, though, is is the debt. So fine bank, bank debt involved in buying commercial property versus residential property is is at times a little bit easier to get. Because the 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 bank. Ass, the bank is evaluating the asset off its ability to produce income okay. to service the debt, yep. not your personal income. Because now you're essentially servicing the debt if you're buying it as a residential exactly. property. Um, so that's cool. So all of those things were attractive to me. But those are the those were the the big differences I would say. The banks like to give money when there's income producing product. Exactly, that makes sense. Yeah, I mean they'll give you money anytime you want, but. Just but they much, really how much it's going to cost. That's you. that rich dad, poor dad, where he always would say his rich dad would. He didn't even have a college education, but the banks yeah. would give him an yeah. array of money because he already bought all these properties. Because he proved the concept that hey, if you give me this money, I'm going to be able to Make give it back this to you. Amount. Exactly. Do commercial property? I've heard that those transactions take longer to close on. Yeah, like, for could sure. take years. Is that true, or is that for sure? I mean, really? something that big definitely can take. I don't know about years, years, but okay. I mean, when you're buying companies are acquiring other companies, mergers and acquisitions, there's physical assets involved with that. So technically yeah. it takes years. But like, you know, investor purchasing a building here in Indianapolis, um, that transaction timeline from signing contract or from LOI to the closing table could be 90 to 180 days. Wow. That's Sometimes cool. it can go faster. So uh, maybe some of your audience listens to like Grant Cardone. Yeah. Um, 
he's in there in like the first seven days under contract and he'll, he'll close in like 30 days on big, big, big deals. Cause he's got the capital, you know, he can yeah. deploy this stuff at scale. He's got a jet. He takes his team down the next day. Like, so you can do that stuff. So sometimes it's not always that short and you're on that level, um, yeah. but like for the groups in the, like the circles that I run and the guys that I know, like, yeah, it's like 90 days usually is what you're asking for on a contract. Okay. Here's a question that we were talking before this podcast yeah. happened. Um, so what do you see say with COVID you know, we've seen a high increase of people working remotely. Mm. What do you think from a innovative adaptive standpoint, we're going to see with hotels, mm -hmm. with commercial buildings that businesses were using for offices? How do you, what, what do you see is going to take place in that realm for them to adapt or are they just going to crumble? You know, I think there is going to be crumbling. Uh, yeah, of course, I don't think it's going to be at scale because someone won't adapt. For sure. Well, people are over leveraged or, yep. you know, there's a lot of businesses that cannot survive this. Yes. Um, especially restaurants. Restaurants oh, are. Oh, gosh. There's <laughs> there's a, a, a friend that I just made who made a joke about um, how, how awful would it be as we, we make it through this pandemic COVID. We get to 2021 and, <laughs> you know, all these restaurants close down. And now we can go out. There's no restrictions. We can go out and, you know, hang out, go to spaces, no masks. And the only place we can go is Applebee's because <laughs> everything's closed down. That's going to be so sad. It's kind of a, a sad reality. But back to the question, um, there's a level of innovation that's going to be required. Yep. Um, we were talking a little bit about adaptive reuse in space. And what I mean by that is I mentioned the, the marsh down in, in uh, Mooresville was converted from obviously a retail space to apartments. Mm -hmm. um, the Kmart on South Madison, no longer a Kmart, is now self-storage. So I think there's going to be a lot of adaptive reuse that's going to happen. Will, I was just listening to a, 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 actually a multifamily like conference um, yesterday. They were talking about expectations around people returning to the office. I do mm -hmm. not, and I agree with this sentiment that I do not feel like the work from home model is the end all be all. Like that's what it, the way it's going to be forever. I think there's going to be a large majority of that. It's going to continue to be like that space. Yes. People are going to go back to the office. Uh, yeah. But or that, even from a management side of things, you have to be able to. Yeah. There's, there's, I think that I just was reading that there's a, there's like indications that the productivity level is starting to drop for a lot of those yes. work from home. Roles. And there's tons of benefits. I mean, hundred, tons of benefits. Tons of benefits but it there's works also a lot for, for, for some companies and roles, but not for everybody. And, no. and some people are, are, um, don't function at, or don't perform as well when they don't have that in-person component. Anyway, though, I, I think there's going to be some innovation required there. People are going to go back to the office, but I think the dynamic of the office space is going to, to shift as well. I think the mm. way those are built, I think the way those are, are currently run, yep. there's going to be changes largely due to the safety concerns around interaction with people and COVID and what if this comes back and all this yep. stuff. Um, so, so things like co-working space or, yeah. um, one thing that I'm spending a lot of time right now is looking at new development. So, uh, new apartment development, um, and conversations we're talking about as well, what spaces can we put into these, these units that are going to be attractive to number one, younger, de younger demographics, people yep. that still want to live in the urban core, uh, but, but desire some of these spaces that, um, like an office, like a co-working space, yeah. but they don't want to be stuck in their, their tiny apartment all day long. So how can we, how can we like bring those products to the market so that we're, you know, filling that gap, that need for a workspace, yeah. but it's not a traditional office. So then what's left over with the office is, um, either going to be converted or converted into, to, to co-working space, something else. I don't know. I mean, there's, there's a hundred different things that people could do with the spaces. Let's ask something. Why can you come over here fast? Yeah, come on, come real on quick. screen, buddy. Why? What is? Um, what have you done to adapt, or what are you going to do in the future to adapt? From a, uh, he's a, he has a studio, but he also does yeah. co-working. Yeah. What do you got? I'm I'm super interested to hear since you're you're in the space here. So you have co-working here, right there. Yeah, so it's okay, actually behind cool. us. Cool. So it's actually doing better than yeah. it ever has yeah. right now, but in the long term, I don't believe in the model. Okay. I just don't believe in it. Um, for the simple fact that you can go work at Starbucks. Like, I mean, I've I've been doing that for two, maybe three years. It just it doesn't make sense. The amount of money that you could lease, like, say, say somebody's downtown, they have to pay seven or eight grand a month to 
a landlord to rent a space out. Tell me how you're supposed to get, and I, I know there's so much marketing you can do. There's, you can make it cool. You can do all this. But how are you supposed to get, say the membership is 100 bucks, right? Mm -hmm. How many people do you have to get to not only break even, but to be able to make more than that 7 or 8K, enough to step away from it and pay somebody else to run it? You got to clean it. There's just so many different things you have to do with it. So you're you're talking about from an operational standpoint. I'm talking about from an owner, operational it standpoint. It doesn't make sense. That it doesn't, doesn't make sense. sense. So, but are you negating the fact that the demand is going to be there for that type of product? I think the demand is not there. Okay. And I think that, that that ties into why, from an operational standpoint, it doesn't make sense. Interesting. Yeah, but that's just my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I mean I've I've been we'll see right I mean, in it, <laughs> but yeah, I just don't think it's going to work. I mean, you look at WeWork. I mean, obviously there was a bunch of. It just got it, it got way too big, and it just it, it became a mess. But I just think that's so. Let me ask you yeah. a, a scenario. Yes, yeah. we you've got a, a guy. He's he's thirty seven years old. He's yeah. got a wife and kids at home. Yeah, um, he traditionally has gone to the office every yeah. single day of his life. Yeah, the office is shut down. They say you're now working remote forever. He's now back at his house, and he's yeah. trying to get work done. He can't because kids are not in school. Yeah, wife's there all day. Maybe that's great. Maybe it's driving him crazy. Yeah. but he needs to go somewhere. Now he's going to Starbucks every yeah. day of the week. Now he's tired of that. Where does he go? I think it makes sense for a lot of people. Okay. I, th I think it does make sense for a lot of people. And I think that like the value we're providing for the price back there is really good cool. for a lot of people. I just don't yeah. think, I just still don't think like the, the economics makes sense. L long term. Long term, yeah. What are you going to, what are you going to do if it doesn't make sense? Right now I've, I've done everything I can with just simple like amenities just i mean we have to make sure our wi-fi is fast enough for people sure. um we have an eye scanner so people can come in at three in the morning um we have coffee we had like we had this, we put in this new water bottle station that was pretty expensive millennial um oasis. the millennial oasis as we like to call it cool. <laughs> um that a lot of people love that um just bit, simple stuff printers uh, outlets everywhere we have like a little lounge area with couches um conference room scheduler on our website i mean we, i've done a Are lot you of seeing stuff a, a decrease in uh i don't know subscribers to the space through, I'm throughout the pandemic or an seeing increase? an actual increase yeah so what, what makes you think do you think it's going to go away the the demand increase is going to go away or is your overhead still doesn't compensate for that increase in demand? i think i think it will probably increase okay. with uh with All the right. pandemic okay. going away i think it'll definitely increase but i still even if it increased a lot it's not it's enough. still when it makes sense interesting Okay. But well, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I mean, we'll see what happens, I guess. Yeah, so, I mean. Maybe. He's got some ideas, though, to, yeah. to still elevate the space if it doesn't increase. That's cool, though. I mean, I would love I, to collaborate with you on yeah, that. Yeah, and, like, the, the fact that it's still, like, I still think, like, an individual basis, me selling it to somebody and them coming in here every day, I think it does make sense for a lot of people, and I think we're providing a lot of value. Like, the people that have came here with not that much business, just the simple fact that you're downtown in the middle of everything, like the yeah. amount of leads that they've gotten, the amount of like business they've built just from being here for 7,500 bucks a month is insane. I think it does provide a lot of value, but I just still doesn't think, I just don't think it makes sense. Well, I'm interested to see how you guys yeah. continue to to pivot and operate through the yeah. throughout the pandemic and into 2021. Yeah. Because I, I mean, I, I, I see your point of operationally it not making sense, but, uh, I think that demand is going to outpace the available you think supply. So? I, and it might. I just, I, I mean, I don't know. It might, yeah. May, may and I'm going to do everything I can for, sure. for that to happen. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, but staying innovative. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm going to do everything uh, I'm I can. I'm glad you, you had that insight for that perfect question. You kind of teed him up for that. That's cool. Yeah, but no, it's good talking with you. Cool. Yeah, man. Well, Corey, if you want to give some handles where we can find you at. Yeah, uh, Instagram, Corey, at Corey the Broker. Um, I'm, I'm actually that everywhere. So his last name is actually broker. <laughs> <laughs> I write it on all my customs forms. Corey, the broker that is my middle name. No, it's Corey Gardner, but I go by Corey, the broker pretty much everywhere. You have a website. I do. Corey, the Nice. I like your link tree. Oh yeah. Yeah. I, there's not a whole lot on there right now, but no. I, I mean, I don't link know. Link tree's sweet. I, I just got last one. time you looked at it, but. No, I haven't looked at it in a minute, but. Yeah. Uh, me, Sam Fouch. Gosh, it's the Sam Fouch show. I'm on YouTube. It's just Sam Fouch. What else am I on? Apple Podcast, uh, Google Podcast, Spotify, and then all social: TikTok, Twitter, Snapchat, LinkedIn. Every place I can get Got some covered, man. Get some free uh, yeah. organic content. That's how I look at it. Facebook, but it's just Sam Fouch or Samuel Fouch on all those platforms. It's a wrap. Cool. Thanks, man. Corey, the broker.
Best day ever. Best, best day ever. Love it.